Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm here again with Jacob and Jed, and we're going on with the Charmides. Today, I expect that we will finish the text. So let me jump to the text now. We'll do a quick review, as I always do. So they've been talking about a number of different possible definitions of temperance. That's our topic for this dialogue. What is temperance? And what we're currently looking at is that the temperate person will know himself and be able to discern what he really knows and does not know and have the power of judging what other people likewise know and think they know in cases where they do know and again what they think they know without actually knowing it. So everyone else will be unable. Only the temperate person can do this. And so... Socrates was summarizing the idea here. So this is being temperate or temperance and knowing oneself. That one should know what one knows and what one does not know. Is that what you mean? And Critias said it is. And so they discussed this a bit. And then um, Socrates, as always, he pokes some holes in it. So let me just jump a little ahead. He said, if you know the science of sciences, or you know this body of knowledge as a body of knowledge, then you might know that you know something or that you don't know it, but you don't know the content of that body of knowledge, so you don't know what you know. And so it would be very limiting. And so they discussed this a bit more, and they kind of dropped it by the time we got to the end of our reading last time, last week. And so they were going to pick up fresh. And I marked it with blue here where we're picking up. And so for those of you following in, in the text, it's page 75 if you have the lobe. But we're looking at 172b. And so they're going to somewhat start fresh, although they're continuing their discussion on this vein, but they're going to kind of take it in another direction here. So, Jacob, you've been doing a great job reading with me. Do you mind reading with me some more? Okay. Okay, great. All right, so Socrates picks up again, saying, Then may we say that there is a good point in the knowledge of knowledge and of lack of knowledge, which we now find to be what temperance is. They didn't actually agree that's what it is, but if we're accepting it as a given, that he who has it will not only learn more easily whatever he learns, but will perceive everything more plainly, since besides the particular things that he learns, he will behold the science, and hence he will probe more surely the state of other people respecting the things which he has learned himself, while those who probe without such knowledge will do it more feebly and poorly, are these, my friend, the kind of advantages that we shall gain from temperance? But are we really looking at something greater and requiring it to be something greater than it really is? Probably that is so. I dare say. And I dare say also that our inquiry has been worthless. And this I conclude because I observe certain strange facts about temperance, if it is anything like that. For suppose, if you please, we concede that there may possibly be a science of science, and let us grant and not withdraw our original proposition that temperance is the knowledge of what one knows and does not know. Granting all this, let us still more thoroughly inquire whether on these terms it will be of any profit to us. For our suggestion just now, that temperance of that sort is our guide in ordering house or state, must be a great boon, was not, to my thinking, Critias, a proper admission. How so? Because we too tightly admitted that it would be a great boon to mankind if each of us should do what he knows, but should place what he did not know in the hands of others who had the knowledge. Well, was that not a proper admission? Not to my mind. In very truth, your words are strange, Socrates. Yes, by the dog, 
and they strike me too in the same way and it was in view of this just now that i spoke of strange results that i noticed and said i feared we were not inquiring rightly for in truth let temperance be ever so much what we say it is i see nothing to show what good effect it has on us how so tell us in order that we on our side may know what you mean I expect I'm talking nonsense, but still one is bound to consider what occurs to one and not idly ignore it if one is even a little concerned for oneself. And you are quite right. Here then my dream, whether it has come through horn or through ivory, and that was a reference to something in Homer. Suppose that temperance were such as we now define her, and that she had entire control of us. Must it not be that every act would be done according to the sciences, and no one professing to be a pilot when he was not would deceive us, nor would a doctor, nor a general, nor anyone else pretending to know something he did not know go undetected? And would not these conditions result in our having greater bodily health than we have now, safety in perils of the sea and war, and skillful workmanship in all our utensils, our clothes, our shoes, nay, everything about us, and various things besides, because we should be employing genuine craftsmen. And if you liked, we might concede that prophecy as the knowledge of what is to be, and temperance directing her will deter the charlatans and establish the true prophets as our prognosticators. Thus equipped, the human race would indeed act and live according to knowledge, I grant you, for temperance on the watch would not suffer ignorance to foist her in and take a hand in our labors, but that by acting according to knowledge we should do well and be happy. This is a point which as yet we are unable to make out, my dear Critias. Still. You will have some difficulty in finding any other fulfillment of welfare if you reject the rule of knowledge. Yes, yeah, so notice that he, so Socrates slipped something else in here. He kind of shifted it to, is this temperance to does it make you happy? Would it be benefit? What would it mean to have this kind of knowledge versus does it make you happy? All right, then inform me further on one more little matter of what is this knowledge do you mean of shoemaking good heavens not i well of working in brass by no means well in wool or wood or in something else of that sort no indeed then we no longer hold to the statement that he who lives according to knowledge is happy so again another shift here we're going to Twerk it a little, tweak it a little more. These workers, though they live according to knowledge, are not acknowledged by you to be, are not acknowledged, excuse me, by you to be happy. You rather delimit the happy man, it seems to me, as one who lives according to knowledge about certain things. And I dare say you are referring to my instance of a moment ago, the man who knows all that is to come, the prophet. Do you refer to him or to someone else? Yes, I refer to him and someone else too. Oh, is it the sort of person who might know besides what is to be, both everything that has been and now is, and might be ignorant of nothing? Let us suppose such a man exists. You are not going to tell me, I am sure, of anyone alive who is yet more knowing than he. No, indeed. Then there is still one more thing I would fain know. Which of the sciences is it that makes him happy? Or does he owe it all, I'm sorry, does he owe it to all of them alike? By no means to all alike. But to which sort most? One that gives him knowledge of what thing? Well, I'm sorry, one that gives him knowledge of what thing? Present, past, or future? Is it that by which he knows drop playing? Drop playing, indeed. Well, reckoning? By no means. Well, health? More likely. 
and that science to which I refer as the most likely, I went on, gives him knowledge of what? Of good and of evil. And that science to which I refer as the most likely gives him knowledge of what? Okay. Sorry. Vile creature, you have all this time been dragging me round and round while concealing the fact that the life according to knowledge does not make us do well and be happy, not even if it be knowledge of all the other knowledges together, but only if it is of this single one concerning good and evil. And evil here, I've mentioned this before, but for those new to this channel, um, evil is not in the Christian sense of like a, a, having a moral feeling to it. It's more of just ignorance or um, the actual word kakko is, um, just means bad. And it doesn't have the same heavy connotation that we tend to give it in our Judeo-Christian society. Uh, Critias, if you choose to take away the science from the whole number of them, will medicine any the less give us health or shoemaking give us shoes or weaving provide clothes? Or will the pilot's art any the less prevent the loss of life at sea or the generals in war? None the less. But my dear Critias, to have any of these things well and beneficially done will be out of our reach if that science is lacking. That is true. And that science, it seems, is not temperance, but one whose business is to benefit us. For it is not a science of sciences and lack of sciences, but now we've redefined um, temperance once again as the science of good and evil. So that if this is beneficial, temperance must be something else to us. But why should it be beneficial? For if temper temperance is above all a science of the sciences and presides too over the other sciences, Surely she will govern this science of the good, and so benefit us. And give us health also? Will she and not medicine do this? And will the several works of the other arts be hers, and not the particular works of each art? Have we not constantly protested that she is only knowledge of knowledge and of lack of knowledge, and nothing else? Is not that so? Apparently it is. Then she will not be a producer of health? No, indeed. For health belongs to another art. I'm sorry, for health, we said, belongs to another art, did we not? We did. Nor of benefit, my good friend, for this work again we assigned to another art just now, did we not? Certainly. Then how will temperance be beneficial if it produces no benefit? By no means, Socrates, as it seems. So do you see, Critias, how all the time I had good reason for my fair, and fair ground for the reproach I made against myself that my inquiry regarding temperance was worthless? For I cannot think that what is admitted to be the noblest thing in the world would have appeared to us useless if I had been of any use for making a good search. But now you see we are worsted every way and cannot discover what thing it can possibly be to which the lawgiver gave this name temperance. And yet we have conceded many points which were not deducti de deductible from our argument, deducible from our argument. For you know we conceded that there was a science of science when the argument was against it and would not agree. And we further conceded that this science could know the works also of the other sciences, when the argument was against this too, in order to make out that the temperate man had a knowledge of what he knew and did not know, so as to know that he knew the one and did not know the other. And we made this concession in a really magnificent manner, without considering the impossibility of a man knowing in some sort of way things that he does not know at all. For our admission says that he knows that he does not know them, and yet in my opinion there can be nothing more irrational than this. Nevertheless, although it has found us so simple-minded and tractable 
the inquiry remains quite incapable of discovering the truth, but has utterly flouted it by most imprudently showing us the inutility of that which we had been ever so long assuming, that our joint admissions and fictions to be the meaning of temperance. Now, so far as I am concerned, I am not particularly distressed. But for your sake, Charmides, I am seriously distressed to think that you, with your goodly form and most temperate soul besides, are to have no profit or advantage from the presence of that temperance in all your life. And I am still more distressed about the charm which I learned from the Thracian that I should have spent so much pains on a lesson which has had such a worthless effect. Now, I really do not think that this can be the case, but rather I am a poor hand at inquiring. For temperance I hold to be a great good, and you to be highly blessed if you actually have it. See now whether you have it and are in no need of the charm. For if it is yours, I should rather advise you to regard me as a babbler who is unable to argue out any subject of inquiry whatsoever, and yourself is advancing in happiness as you advance in temperance. Jed, do you mind jumping in as Charmides? Why, upon my word, Socrates, I do not know at all whether I have it or have it not. For how can I know when even you two are unable to discover what this thing is. So you say, but of this you do not at all convince me. And I quite believe, Socrates, that I do not need the charm. And for my part, I have no objection to being charmed by you every day of my life until you say I have enough of the treatment. Very well. Now, Charmides, if you do this, it will be a proof to me of your temperance. If you submit to be charmed by Socrates and do not forsake him through thick and thin. Count on me to follow and not forsake him, for it would ill become me to disobey you, my guardian, and refuse to do your bidding. Well, now I bid you. Then I will do as you bid, and will start this very day. There, there, what are you two plotting to do? Nothing. We have made our plot. So will, you will use force before even allowing me to make my affidavit? You must expect me to use force, since he gives me the command. Take counsel, therefore, on your side as to what you will do. But that leaves no room for counsel. For if once you set about doing anything and use force, no man alive will be able to withstand you. Then do not you withstand me? Oh, not a question. Then do not you withstand me. Oh, okay. then don't withstand me, Socrates. <laughs> then I will not withstand you. Okay, what happened there? So I think many people, when they read this dialogue, they come away saying, what? What just happened? What is this dialogue about? Okay, well, let's go back a little bit. Um, so he brought in the idea of good and evil. And uh, where did that come in? Um, 174C, page 83, here. Okay. Good and evil. What do you see here? Is this a closer definition, do you think, of temperance? Jacob, what were you thinking at this section of the dialogue? So... 
when we said like it's the science of sciences and mm -hmm. we mentioned the last talk kind of uh mm -hmm. science meant like measure uh like a measure mm -hmm. and so it's like the measure of measurement mm -hmm. i would say like maybe uh socrates is taking it to like how do you measure a measurement well it's mm -hmm. like kind of like the highest level of measurement we have i guess could be good good versus bad you know mm -hmm. everything kind of falls into that and and he says that you know it's the way that it, we good at we the, the way we do well in any other science is through our mastery of knowing whether what we're doing is good or bad because that uh, that like allows us to evaluate like measure our mm. you know uh actions inside that you know science that we're doing good yeah kind of, okay. do you agree that that's the right measure um i don't know i i i think it comes back to when when uh, socrates defined it as like an order having like you know mm -hmm. things being in order it made me think like okay like how do you know if if you're being ordered or not mm -hmm. well you'd have to have that that measurement of whether it was good or, or bad like mm -hmm. you, any kind of ordering that you would you would make would be based off that scale of like mm -hmm whether something's good or bad. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I like it then uh, from that respect that I think it ties in with mm -hmm. his other definition mm -hmm. to to an extent. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Just kind of, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, he does, he does kind of say like, that doesn't bring us happiness. So it's not mm -hmm. like, it, it, it can't be temperance. So there's gotta be some flaw with it, but I, st I still think it's, it's okay. It's a pretty good one. Mm -hmm definition right yeah and for platonists of course the first principle of all the first cause of all is called the good or one of the names for it is the good and so if what is most true or most real is good then that would be the measure right and what falls away from it is less good until you get to bad right right that's a, mm. that's my line of thought mm. right. there. As well. mm. Jed, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with both of those points. Mm. Um, Jake, Jake is one has to be true. If it's a knowledge that can apply to other knowledges, it has to be about good or bad so that whatever you are measuring within that skill you can say whether it was a good or bad measurement. Because I did go ahead and say it can't apply to everything specifically because you still have to learn medicine. You still have to learn drafts. You still have to learn brass making. But whatever measurement you're making within that field, you can judge whether or not it was a good measurement. So it has to be the judgment of good and bad in terms of your measurements within mm -hmm. and then they add but also how you use it to benefit how you function with it and then they added happiness so it's being able to judge whether you're measuring well within the skill and using it well to bring benefit and happiness that is the only way that a knowledge of knowledge seems to make sense and then if it is therefore a standard Overall, it would have to be um, a more primary leader of the class of all of the individual classes. Mm -hmm. It has to be something that applies to bronze work and applies to medicine and applies to anything. And you mm -hmm. saying that the ultimate term is the good would therefore make it preside over everything mm -hmm. and both the measurement and the use of the measurement Therefore, we left by saying temperance is a knowledge of the good and how it can apply to any field. 
Do you think that's what temperance is? Well, I have heard that there are um, uh, people who have the this the job of the guru, and his job is to judge whether or not what one is saying is actually knowledge. So that seems to be um, a really good example of somebody who's just judging good and bad or knowledge and a lack of knowledge mm -hmm. is what this person's saying, whatever it is I'm asking them about, is it from a place of knowledge in their mm. being? Mm. So that seems to be something where you can judge knowledge or a lack of knowledge or good measurement and use and bad measurement and use without having to know a particular skill set. Mm. So, but, or maybe I'm misunderstanding it completely. All right. Well, I'll just play devil's advocate here. So um, we're saying temperance is a measurement of good and bad and how well you can measure if a person is applying their art correctly. So like, is the doctor a good doctor or a bad doctor? Are they doing art correctly, the shoemaker? What if the art you want to measure is being a con artist? Now, if somebody's a good con artist, then that means they're very good at tricking other people and stealing their money. So you can see good there in the terms of are they doing it well, but it's very different from the moral sense of good, of is it beneficial to others? Right? It's not beneficial to others because you're stealing from them. But the con artist is probably, the good con artist is probably happy. So is that person temperate according to this definition? Well, Socrates sometimes sets little traps and seems to mm -hmm. be tricking people. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's the first category without the second. You are, you are good at using it, but you're not using it to benefit the person you're using it for. Whereas Socrates might trick people in order to get them to talk about no, temperance. He's not a con like. artist. Most people would not define him as a con artist. He's not tricking people in the art of, con art, of conning people. Right. So if the definition of con artist is that first category only to trick people without mm -hmm. um, that second category and therefore use it artfully to benefit, mm -hmm. then it's only half of an art and doesn't count. Mm -hmm. But if the art was um, sophistry, let's say, which involves sometimes tricks or mm -hmm. conning, maybe when Socrates says he doesn't have temperance or he's not wise, that's a little trick mm -hmm. in there somewhere. Um, but only for the use of one's benefit and bringing uh, happiness, mm -hmm. then that would be the true art that con artistry is only half mm -hmm. of an art for. Mm -hmm. I think you're stretching the definition of con artist, quite frankly, because, um, I mean, a lot of people in their professions will use tricks. Like a dentist, when he was pulling my son's two, said, I'm going to count to three, and then he pulled on one. It wasn't to con my son. It was because it was the way to pull the tooth with the least drama. And he knew that it would, you know, the pain would be just for a second and it would be gone. And so it was actually a, a compassionate thing to do for, to the kid, right? Because he's also stressed about getting his tooth pulled. So there are many situations. You can think of many professions where a person will use a trick to benefit but that's not being a con artist. We have a very specific idea of a con artist, somebody who's trying to trick people out of their money, usually out of money. Right. Yeah. In, in which case, um, we can add a third kind of judgment to our definition of temperance. Um, the ability to not just measure within an art, not just be able to use it beneficially, but also to be able to judge the uh, arts themselves, mm -hmm. whether or not they are a good art mm -hmm. or they're a bad art or not mm -hmm. an art at all. Mm -hmm. Because, and I think maybe the metric is, do you have both? Do you have an ordered judgment within a hierarchy of terms? 
and do you have the ability to use it for people's benefit? Mm -hmm. If it's just tricking people without benefiting them, that's only half of it. Therefore, it's not a true art. Therefore, that third mm -hmm. kind of judgment can come into play and, so, and we can use temperance to say, not an art, leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Okay. Um, before I say anything more, Jacob, what are your thoughts on all this? So, I've... I think that so like what one of the things that Socrates says he he knows is dialectics and then like it's kind of a like lost art nowadays where people don't study it as much right um but like dialectics were like a big thing back back then and that's kind of maybe that like being very persuasive kind of gets into that uh Territory. I I I don't know if uh, I'm like maybe are we conflating temperance with holiness? Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to throw any other term in there, but I mm -hmm. I think when like you, we talked about the con artist example, I guess my intuition is to say that uh, they are temperant, but they they're not holy or like they, you know like. I kind of want to take morality out of the good and bad distinction, mm -hmm. but my like, you know, pre charmides idea of mm -hmm. temperance was based on morality. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I, I should separate it based on what is said in the text, or you know, if it, it you know, morality is part of temperance, in which case the con artist uh, example proves the point from the text about Socrates saying, all right, well, you know, temperance is, is not this art of arts, you know, uh, mm. measurement of, of measurement, mm. uh, kind of thing, because, you know, that, that counter example, you know, blows the, you know, there's plenty of other examples too, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, a good idea to get you in the mindset of maybe where Socrates is coming from to, mm -hmm. You know, say that that's not temperance. Yeah, we had a number of examples of temperance, or at least a number of efforts to define it. It was first Charmides gave us orderly and quiet, and then modest, and then the idea of doing one's own business, and then maybe it's the doing of good things, maybe it's self-knowledge, which is where we ended up here, and then the science of itself and other sciences. Knowing yourself and what you know and what you don't know, and um, you know this idea of good and evil. But does any of this actually tell us what temperance is? They left it open ended. Is it because they're just being facetious, or is it because we haven't defined temperance yet? Is it? and I think Jacob raised this point. Is this temperance? Yeah, I think it's like the Theotetus where they're. <laughs> <laughs> they're just saying what it's not. It's like yeah. it's not any of these things. But they're like prob they're prob like like the Theatetus, they're probably like getting or getting there, like getting closer. I'd I'd like to think as the dialogue gets like if we followed this path, we might mm. find temperance. But also I might I could be wrong. And, just, and these are just like mm -hmm. these are not temperance examples. Mm. So well, with the, it's interesting you bring up Theotetus, because in the Theotetus, there were hints. He mentioned Parmenides. There was one section where he mentioned this other way of thinking. And that was the hint that if you were to follow that and do the homework on your own, it's outside of the dialogue. But the hint is there where you could do the work to find what knowledge is. Is there, do you see anything in this dialogue? that points you to what temperance actually is? I, li I like the, the mm -hmm. part where he says it's like an order. And I also am kind of curious about the quick dismissal of modesty mm -hmm. with the uh, mythic source being cited mm -hmm. to say that it's definitely not this, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. And what do you think of the charm? There was that rather silly section in the beginning where he told Charmides that uh, he has a charm to get rid of your headache. 
or a special leaf, but you have to know the charm. And at the end as well, let me go back to the text here. At the end as well, there was a mention of the charm. Where is it? That Charmity says that he will be charmed by you. I'm willing to be charmed by you. Mm. Yeah, here. To be charmed by Socrates. I think that some university professors take this in a, they have a, they take it in a sexual way, but he means something very different, I would argue. Any ideas what it might mean to be charmed and what that might have to do with temperance? I think it has something to do maybe with having your like, you know, you're focused on something like you mm -hmm. have like a, you know, a certain focus, something, something in mind that mm -hmm. you're striving for, like kind of, you know, where your gaze is fixed up, you know, upwards kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And how would that charm somebody? Just, I want you to complete the thoughts. I think you're making a good point. I just want you to. Okay. Um, <laughs> just by like, maybe, maybe like leading by example or something like you, you would mm -hmm. charm somebody by being in that, you know, state of, you know, uh, being so focused on the, you know, uh, you know, ha just having something that you're really focused on. It can be you know, uh, like encouraging, it's not the word I'm looking mm -hmm. for, but, you know, okay. inspiring that, to, to others. What does that do to the soul? I'd say it makes it more ordered. If you're more mm -hmm. focused and you're, you're not like, you know, it's being more unitive and less mm -hmm. like all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jed, what are you thinking about? You look deep in thought there. Yeah, I think it's, well, first of all, I like your con artist example to go back a step because um, it seems like we are being drip fed clues which isn't con artists without that second part to benefit. And even at the end, we get an example of Socrates saying, you, you want to follow my words and be ordered by me? What? What if I resist? Are you going to be quick and assertive and forceful? And he goes, yes, I'm going to do it, which is what you would want from a student. Hmm. So It's also the opposite of his first definition of temperance, by the way being oh yes it is the opposite yes mm. but it it does involve one of those clues we were given along the way because in counteracting being passive he said well if we really want to like are we benefited in our life unless if we're not uh quick and forceful um and here he is being quick and forceful and saying no i'm going to be ordered by you socrates and charmed as well mm -hmm. So he's, he's, he's been turned around, but there is that little bit of, not con artistry, but um, Socrates kind of uh, 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 tricking it out of him, not tricking it out of him, um, pl using his feeling. words. Yeah, using his words in a not simply factual way, but in a, word, in a way that will inspire the best out of his soul. By saying, what, are you going to, even if I object, are you going to really, uh, you know, like the old um, proverb, um, make sure you're sitting at the gates of the Zendo until they let you in? Are you going to really make sure you're interested in this? So he's using his words in a way that inspires mm -hmm. his soul to act for his benefit, which sounds like a charm. Mm -hmm. And... 
he's yeah, and he is benefiting by it, and it harkens back to one of the points that we kind of made but left open earlier. Mm-hmm. And if we take that as maybe a principle or indicative of what's happening in the text as a whole, I think we could go back and collect all of these little points that were made but were left unresolved. And if we do that, we might get a fuller picture. So, for example, we said, um, well, it's, it's probably something to do with science but can't be science it's more knowledge but what what is this knowledge that can well it has to be a knowledge that applies to all knowledges but it can't be specific in a science sort of a way but what is that and then we got maybe well we don't know it and then we got given the other clue well is it to do with good and you pointed out well good is a primary term in philosophy so something about knowledge, something about the good, but we also don't know it. And there is some sort of charm involved, but it also has to benefit us and will also make us happy. So we've got this like this bowl of terms we're being presented. Mm-hmm. And right at the end, it seems like Charmity's... Um, has something from that in that Mm -hmm. he's aware that it's something to do with knowledge that's transcendent something to do with the good but also that he doesn't know he doesn't know and yet he's going to be quick and forceful pursuing that which he doesn't know and he's going to listen to his guardian at the end you're my guardian Mm -hmm. and you command me to act in this way that will end up one of the other clues, ordering me, following mm-hmm. someone who might be close to that knowledge of the good. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm going to focus on. That's what I'm going to be quick and forceful in pursuing while recognizing I don't know it. And it's likely mm-hmm. something that transcends and still applies to each and still applies to how it's used and still can make you happy in the end. And even though I don't know it, I'm going to chase you down Socrates maybe (laughs) I don't know (laughs) yeah by the way science is episteme so it's being used here synonymous with knowledge but yeah so there were many different um many different many times when they sort of dropped something and changed the subject and like Jacob mentioned he's still curious why would they drop modesty Uh, why does that stick out in your mind by the way I'm curious the modesty. Just so, so quick. The other ones, they mm-hmm. gave them, they gave it some thought, or they they would have some back and forth, and it's just uh, I feel like it's out of character for Socrates to just say like you're wrong on this one. Like trust, uh, H- Homer said you're wrong. Trust me. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Does it strike you as maybe a good definition, or has something uh, some element about it that's good? Is it attractive in some way? It's a good question. I don't. I don't know. I don't think it is a good definition. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but uh, I think that it it stands out nonetheless. Uh, mm-hmm. And why even put it in here if mm-hmm. it's if it's definitely not? So, mm-hmm. kind of makes me want to read Homer and see if there's any hints in there. Well, I think the thing that's unsettling for me about this dialogue is that I don't really feel like they touched on whatever temperance is. Um, The way it's described as this knowledge of knowledge, it sounds like it's something you could learn at school. You can take a class on temperance. But is that what it is? Is it something that you can take notes on and memorize? Socrates says he doesn't know it, and Charmides is, at the end, doing what his guardian is telling him to do, so he's oblivious, so doesn't, I don't know, like, how can, how can you say you have, how can people say Socrates has it when he's saying he doesn't know it, Mm -hmm. 
And Socrates and Charmides is just following something else that's ordering him. Mm-hmm. What's going on there? You, you obviously, I don't know. What does that mean? Okay, yeah, let's talk about the ending then. That is a weird ending. Was it all tongue in cheek? Was with this whole, I order you all, then I guess I have to do it. Is that meant to be taken literally as like, oh, I'm only doing this because my guardian said so? Or was it more tongue in cheek kind of way? Or how did you take that? And what was the whole point there of this whole force thing? What does that tell us about temperance? Jacob, what was your take on the ending there? So, all right, I'm going to go out on a limb and just say that, mm-hmm. you know, the guardian mm-hmm. uh, figure could be like, mm-hmm. you know, in this instance, like a god, basically, or some higher okay. being. And to, you know, continue the pursuit of, of you know, what they wish for you and not to be like um you know temperance may might be forcing yourself to continue that you know quest to you know appease that that guardian you know someone that of a higher disposition than yourself and so you took it then literally that's he, that Charmides really is going to follow Socrates because his guardian said so. Yes. I mean, and, yeah, it's kind of like playfully, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not sure the history of it, if that actually mm-hmm. happened, if Charmides like joined Socrates in school or anything like that. But no, he actually took a yeah. negative turn, became part of the 30 tyrants. But, uh. <laughs> but. And this idea of following, that's an interesting point, though, the idea of following the gods or your daimon or, is that temperance? Maybe. Seems like a good idea if your daimon is telling you to do something that you (laughs) listen to it. Mm. And then forcing, then forcing Socrates to take him on as a student because his guardian, that's, that's a kind of a weird twist to force him. So that, that, yeah, but that's an interesting avenue. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Jed? I love it. I love it. I think, I think you got there because all the way through we've been talking about, mm-hmm. Hey, doctors have a certain kind of, knowledge within their skill set but you know do they do they know how to use it all the time to benefit or or could every human example be corrupted in some way um not you know doctors don't always make the right measurement and they don't always use it for their benefit so what we but we do uh, they did say in the, what we read today that we always defer and we rightfully defer to those who have knowledge, which is something we've seen in other texts as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we leave our um, training in horsemanship to the person who has knowledge about horsemanship. We train it, we leave our horses to that person, that sort of thing. So we need someone who can measure and use it for our benefit. And we also pointed out should probably know the nature of the good and what's not good in that. Um, and we should defer to them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not we're not going to find it among doctors and brass workers. Um, and there's something charming, something that has some force to inspire and uplift our soul as well, which you don't really find among brass workers and doctors as well. So it's like we've been stripping away. Fairness, though, many people are inspired by their particular. Um, area, a certain art is, can be inspiring. Some people really love That's medicine. True. It's not just a job. Some people really love brass work. It's not just a craft that pays the bills. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I doubt that they would be able to inspire many others. Look <laughs> at this great... Um, um, horseshoe that I made with my brass working. Isn't it inspiring? Um, 
so has to have the ability to charm others and benefit others um but uh, but even even that example if there's something you find charming and inspiring and uplifting towards the divine about your particular skill i think it would be the presence of these higher elements that happen to be within like focus you see the ordering and the single-minded focus these are parts of the whole that we are creating here so we've gone through this process of saying look at all these good things that are present in what we can see usually in some sort of corrupted form but there has to be a higher and that's why i like when uh jacob brought in the idea of of god or something divine because that might be the archetype or the one that has those qualities that we see in pieces with people inspired by medicine or brass working um and has it in pieces when we use our art of medicine well to benefit but we're not going to find it here completely in an uncorrupted sense so um recognizing that that we won't find it amongst us humans and also every step of the argument we're left saying i don't know i don't know or we can't say mm -hmm. or so we're also sort of reminding ourselves over and over that we as humans don't know so not only is the ideal art we're building not really present amongst those of the sense world but we also don't know therefore the only logical conclusion is we need some sort of guardian that does transcend our physical realm and examples therefore a god or what uh, like you said a daemon of mm -hmm. some kind mm -hmm. but then that makes sense from the reason of what we've been talking about but then there's that other element of well do we trust it over socrates do we trust our divine guardian which i'm in agreement this is a like a metaphor for even if socrates says well i don't want it we could mm -hmm. say well we've seen that y humans can miss the mark mm -hmm. and you've said you don't have the knowledge so i'm trusting my guardian and i'm not going to be passive i'm going to be that one of the rare positive terms we do have mm -hmm. Uh, quick and quick and forceful in saying following my guardian even though I don't know because of all of these things we've said it is more likely to know the good it knows that um, works for our benefit I think you just slipped from using the um, Critias as an analogy for the guard for um, the gods for actually being the god he's not a daimon he's just a guy right right Providence and I think that's through us and so you have to have judgment of who you're going to listen to still. Mm. Right. And I think that's the mm. homework we're left with. D does Charmides mm. take all those points together to realize that the human person mm -hmm. who is following mm -hmm. uh, might not, well, from our reasoning, will necessarily fall short in knowing the good, knowing how mm. it filters down, knowing how it could, all those things we've just said. Mm. Um, has he put them together to make the choice on who is the guardian mm. that while he himself recognizes he doesn't know mm. recognizes he needs to be ordered and inspired in a charming way by someone who knows and has the art mm -hmm. and therefore must be quick and forceful in pursuing that mm. under the uh, leadership of the guardian of his guardian our question is does Charmides put that together and make the right judgment about who he follows? Hmm. I'll suggest another way to take that and that analogy that Jacob presented us. Um, looking at this ending again here, so maybe Socrates is not really fighting. Um, he's like, "Well, I can't withstand you if you say you want to do this." Um, and I would suggest, instead of suggesting that one of them is representing a daimon and the other is not, but rather that um, the law of providence is that providence works through us, and we can each participate in the divine to the degree that we're able to. 
And so Providence can be working through both Critias and Socrates and Charmides as well, um, but to different degrees that they're able to um, communicate. And Charmides saying, I definitely want to do this, I'm going to force you, is showing that he's willing to participate. And if you're willing to participate, the divine will not turn you away. Providence will always meet you. To the, it's, it's just there. And you participate, it, you participate in it to the degree that you're able. So if he's willing to participate, it's there for him. Socrates, is, he says, I will not withstand you. Then, then how would you know whether someone is working through providence or they're missing the mark and when they say, I don't want to do it, that's, that's their problem or, or their ignorance showing? How can you discern? That's our challenge. But that's, we're always using our judgment and we're always trying to participate to the degree we're able. Those who are able to participate well have temperance. <laughs> Those who are just stubborn perhaps do not oh so would temperance would temperance be being able to judge whether those we are interacting with have providence working mm -hmm. through them when they say yes or no and when they don't so when they say no when mm -hmm. providence is not working through them mm -hmm. we will be forceful in what we've decided and when they say no, when it is working mm. through them, we can use our temperance to discern the presence, the presence of that divine guardian who has all of those actually providential qualities mm. and, uh, and refuse them. Um, yeah, I'd say that you have to use your own judgment. I mean, that's what we're always doing. You will look around at who's a real teacher, who isn't, who's, um, you're reading different, um, different books. Oh, do you want to follow Plato? Do you want to follow Immanuel Kant? Do you want to follow Nietzsche? Um, which appeals to you more? Which one speaks to you? Which one strikes you as being wiser uh, when you're meeting people, when you're checking YouTube videos and, you know, you see that there are many different teachers, many different schools of thoughts, Buddhism and Hinduism and philosophy in many areas. Is this worth watching or not? You know, you, you're always using your judgment. Sometimes there are, like, you've made that judgment. You've found a mm -hmm. teacher. And sometimes they might be doing what Socrates is doing and saying the opposite, saying, mm -hmm. I refuse. And as a trick, and sometimes they're saying it legitimately, and they'll, in you know, you well, hang on. When is it the trick and when is it... Mm -hmm legitimate and I should be following to be a good follower of my of the guardian those are your questions and and how you choose as something about your state of mind oh well <laughs> didn't we just conclude that we like in order to make that decision we have to apply this knowledge of knowledge and and whether or not that's good or bad what they're saying when they're saying no i refuse is that good or is that bad and if it's good i'll listen if it's bad i'm going to be quick and forceful in refusing yeah, so maybe those are elements of temperance so it's left open for you to think about I think you what? did a lot of the legwork for for us and helped us out a great deal by by giving us the word providence because all of those things we have collected along the way that we we can't see physical examples of be in its ideal sense providence always beneficial always mm -hmm. ordering always working to bring your happiness and benefit um always forceful mm -hmm. like dreams for example um well and then the next step is once we've collected those terms and given it a word providence mm -hmm. where can we look to find a guardian like that that we should quick and forcefully follow even though we ourselves don't know mm -hmm. so we're not acting from our own art or knowledge but we're mm -hmm. aware that we don't know but we are following that providential guardian mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So that's what we have to look to and follow. And I guess what you're saying is as we progress, we will be able to make those judgments as to whether there is providence functioning for, through that person mm -hmm. accurately. Mm -hmm. And Socrates saying, I don't want to talk about that. And so you don't, mm -hmm. or it's the other case where he's saying, Oh, I don't want to talk about that, but you should refuse. So maybe I, I don't, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, mm -hmm. I get the following the guardian of providence and we're having to find where that is, mm -hmm. um, while acknowledging you don't know, and you won't find actual mm -hmm. examples in the physical senses. Mm -hmm. I just don't know how you discern in the everyday sense. Well, remember that all of the, we've seen other places and other discussions that all the virtues are guided by wisdom. You can't idiot proof the virtues, including temperance. So you always have to use judgment. But yes, there is a learning curve. Hmm. Right. And that may, I guess the more you do look for that providential guardian, mm -hmm. which themselves by definition would be wisdom or have wisdom or participate in wisdom in that it mm -hmm. can discern the good from the bad and use it providentially and so forth. And so the more you listen and, and follow, the more you become like mm -hmm. that and the more you learn to be less idiot, <laughs> you, 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 you unidiot yourself mm -hmm. by, yeah, hanging around with Socrates, by following mm -hmm. that, and maybe charm as well, like finding those things that order, can make the, the, the things that we can see, ordering mm -hmm. um, something to do with good and bad, mm -hmm. makes us happy, benefits, but also has that mysterious element of charm, which, mm -hmm inspires and uplifts us towards mm. the transcendental. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Jacob, what are you thinking of all that? Is it good stuff. I, I want to bring in a quick analogy from the Phaedrus mm. about the soul being a chariot with two mm. horses. Mm -hmm. One bad horse, you got one good horse. Mm -hmm. And the bad horse, right, you gotta you gotta charm it, basically. You you have to force it to mm be good and mm -hmm. so to you know i guess i'm not really concerned about the judgment aspect of it but you just have to let providence guide you as much as as you can but you still have to keep that horse the bad horse under control mm -hmm. you, you know so um that would be like you know the judgment of what how to do that how to charm that that horse but then you know, how it relates to the soul is just, you know, you got to keep that, keep the focus and, and let providence guide you. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you're doing everything in your power to appease the gods, mm -hmm. then they are, you know, they, they'll, uh, you know, help you out. Basically, mm -hmm. you won't, you won't, ha you won't have to be so disconcerting because, you know, it will kind of come together for you. Uh, if you're doing everything you can, you know. Hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. So you have to, you have a certain direction you're going in using that chariot example. There's a certain direction you're trying to go in. The good horse naturally pulls in that direction. The unruly horse needs a little discipline to get into line. And you see both horses being ruled by, by temperance, you're saying? That both directing the good horse and the unruly horse are aspects of temperance is that how you're bringing it in here i think so yeah mm -hmm. from the ending to say like mm -hmm. you're gonna have to force it with the bad horse mm -hmm. and then yeah like temperance in general would be keeping them going in the direction mm -hmm. that's good because you know if you aren't facing it in the in a direction <laughs> the right direction then yeah you're mm -hmm. just gonna Go be going in the wrong direction. So sorry, is it... go sorry, ahead. Socrates the bad horse. No, <laughs> but you will. 
the willing to use force to keep mm. the you know to keep things moving okay. would mm. would be yeah the bad horse doesn't want he doesn't want to to do it but you gotta make him take you to the right place it's maybe not a great analogy but <laughs> I, I don't know I'm, that's the phaedrus is on my mind as well so okay fair enough want to try to tie it in okay yeah, maybe we'll wrap this up if Jed has enough one final comment. Well, in this example, wouldn't Socrates too, being a human, have a good and bad horse? Yeah. And so there might be a part of Socrates that, that he is recognizing needs some discipline and he must be forceful and saying, hey, you order me. I, you are the one who I need to follow and order me and my guardian is giving me direction to do so. So there's a combination of two, my own judgment and from my reasoning and that from um, a higher source, That's which true. I acknowledge has... <laughs> yeah, uh, Charm Charmides is directing Critias, is that right, at the end? No, Critias is directing Charmides. Exactly. So Charmides mm -hmm. is... is making his own judgment mm -hmm. based on his reasoning and looking to mm -hmm. yes. the guidance from a higher mm -hmm. figure. Mm -hmm. And I think that I like that because that ties in um, what Mindy was saying about providence acting through us, mm -hmm. but being humans, we, d we also have both horses. Mm -hmm. So being firm in your focus that I'm looking for providence in everything everyone I'm interacting with is going to have one or two horses. I have to use my own reasoning and judgment to f while focused on the highest good and providence and listening to the charming guidance from a higher figure, wherever that is in my life and be forceful towards that. And if Socrates is acting from his bad horse, the discipline, the forceful and quickness, and if he's in the good horse, then it's, I guess it's an easier and you can flow along. Mm. But that leaves us with um, what then is the ideal guardian mm. and, and what is the example of that providence in the text? And if we see that even Socrates might be good horse and bad horse, mm -hmm. like at the end, I don't think Socrates is the representation of that. In fact, he says, I'm not, I don't know temperance, so maybe he's giving us a clue. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that we're following that discerns providence through everyone and is the character of temperance in the text isn't Socrates, but the logos. Mm -hmm. I think it's the logos that he's listening to of Socrates. Mm -hmm. And when Socrates isn't following his logos, he's saying, no, it's the logos of the guardian that, that he's following. It's the logos of the charm that inspires us. And yeah. And if we look to like in my own life, if I look to providential guardians who have a higher knowledge that themselves can be quick and forceful and single-mindedly focus on providence. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see dreams and yeah. for, for those who are open to it, the daemon. So these would be examples of that ideal figure that we could look to that are both rep, uh, referenced by Socrates in various mm -hmm. texts, dreams mm -hmm. and daemons, mm -hmm. um, as one of the, better doctors in that better discerners of logos through which we get providence mm. upon which we must make our decisions and make our single-minded focus. If, if we are focusing on temperance, sorry, if we're focusing on providence singularly as our aspect of temperance, then the thing that we look to, to get that would be the logos. Mm -hmm. And even when you said, by the way, the good is the highest term, that was speaking from the logos. Mm -hmm. And like we said earlier, we can look to 
things like the Parmenides to get an even clearer logos on why that is the case. Hmm. Yeah, well, I'd want to go into the Parmenides or the logos right now, because that's a whole nother discussion. But yeah, I think that we did a good deal about fleshing out this dialogue, getting a sense of what the clues are here of what temperance is. And of course, he doesn't answer it. It's one of the early dialogues. He doesn't tell us what temperance is, but he left us some breadcrumbs. And so I will leave it there. Um, from next week, I was thinking to do Euthyphro. And um, so I will give you guys a link and put a link in the description box for those of you watching on YouTube. And I hope that you will join us next week with Euthyphro. Thank you very much. Bye. -bye.